first, thanks for coming to the conference, first of all, and thanks for not going outside because it's nice. Uh, the subtitle of this talk was Software Engineering for Audio Engineering Dummies, but I didn't like that one. Or Software Engineering for Audio Engineers Using One Weird Trick, which of course is identity theft. Uh, or software engineering in three times 10 to the fourth easy steps. I didn't think that one worked either. So um, Ari was saying yesterday that there are two types of talks. There's a technical and a psychological. This isn't really a technical talk. We may talk about a few technical things, but not really. This is more of the psychological talk. And like most presenters, you don't really get up and want to talk about yourself, you know? But this talk is actually about me. So this is the enough about you, let's talk about me. Enough about me, tell me what do you think about me kind of talk. Um, so first of all, I'm a father. I have a three and a half year old daughter. I am a husband. I've been married for 13 years. I am a Georgian native, uh, born but not inbred in the South, as I like to say. <laughs> I am 44, and the reason I put this up is because you will see some numbers, and most people, when they look at me, think I'm a lot younger than 44, so they start going, 20 years? Wait, that doesn't make sense. Um, and yes, this is my real hair. Uh, I did not pay someone to make me look like this. All right, so, uh, so what did I do? Previously, I, I did a lot of things. I started making records when I was in high school. Um, I was a freelance engineer for 20 years. Uh, yes, 20 years. I've been doing audio for about 25 years. I have worked on Grammy-winning records, multi-platinum records. I worked at a pretty high level, thankfully. I owned an equipment rental company. I would rent really high-end, odd, esoteric equipment to recording studios, and we'll get into some of that because it is sort of an odd thing Old technology to us is like the iPad Mini that came out, you know, but in the world of audio, vintage audio is something that was made in the 50s, and it's still very usable. I had the first uh, workstation that was actually available for rent in the southeast, and boy was that a pain. Uh, I've also produced records, Celtic records, jazz records bunch of other different type of records, so a lot you have never heard of. Uh, what else? I've been a partner in several recording studios. I have mixed concerts. Uh, I mixed concert for 20,000 people, um, a band I had never worked with, on a console I had never touched, uh, on a PA system I had never heard before. That was a lot of fun. Um, I have mixed and recorded live television award shows, and I've also done episodic television, uh, you know, a couple of seasons of shows. Uh, I was an adjunct professor at an audio school, so I got to teach not kids, but what they become when they get older. <laughs> uh, I've done a lot of live events, everywhere from Ted Turner's 75th birthday that was hosted by Jay Leno. Uh, with an estimated budget of about $2 million. Two, I did a Kennedy wedding once. That, that's a story for another time. Uh, but everything to like make a wish and fundraising events. I've done everything, it feels like. Uh, and I've also spent four years designing, building, and operating an 85,000 square foot, $40 million performing arts center uh, in Kennesaw, Georgia. Uh, there's a few pictures in there. And I've never been to prison. So, <clears throat> I think it's important to point that out. I've also done work for the Olympics. That's me in Athens, 2004. Yes, that is the hair. Um, it's funny because my w I cut my hair two years ago. Uh, it had been this way for pretty much my high from high school on. So when that hair was wet, it was halfway down my back. I mean, I was like, you know, get a haircut. Um, and that's actually what it looks like when I was in Beijing, just being silly. Most of the time I wore it up, you couldn't even tell how long it was. Eventually it was just like, this is, I'm tired of this. 
Um, what do I do now? So I'm an iOS developer at Possible Mobile. We are a um, company that does apps for large corporations. Unfortunately, we're not really allowed to tell you which ones, but you have seen our apps featured on the App Store. You've seen them featured in WWDCs. You've actually probably seen TV ads for some of our apps. Uh, it's like Sapien, we do big projects. I give talks, so I, I actually started giving talks at work, uh, lunch and learns, so that I could be like, hey, I don't understand this, I'm gonna figure it out, and then I'll bore everyone at work with it. Uh, I do mostly about Swift. We pretty much only write in Swift now, except for those few times we are dragged kicking and screaming back to the Ejective C world where we have to deal with a third party library that our clients like, you gotta use this. Thanks for nothing. Uh, I spend a lot of time chasing my daughter around because she's three and I'm old and she's small and fast. And I try to stay out of prison. <laughs> it takes more time than you think. Uh, this is the only technical slide. This is like when I, because normally I give technical talks. Like, hey, let's talk about optionals and what they are. Let's talk about functional programming. Let's talk about that kind of stuff. And this is sort of my, you must, must be at least this tall to ride this ride slide. So if you understand what this says, hey, how are you? Uh, then most of my technical talks are pretty easy for you to follow. So just that is who I am in Swift. And there will be no more code. So I went effectively from one career where people didn't understand what I did to another career where people don't understand what I did, including clients, like most of our clients, most of your clients don't really understand what you do. It's like, you type words on a screen and then I, my app works, right? That's, well, okay, sure. So I try to explain to people, okay, what is programming? Well, we try to understand a problem, we try to reason a solution, and then we try to implement it. That makes some sense to people, so you don't really have to get too crazy with that explanation, but when it comes to audio engineering, I honestly got to the point where I just said, I just make things louder. <laughs> because trying to explain what I do, what I did, it was just certain, forget it. Most people have seen like recording in a movie or an MTV, and it's like, yeah, that's not exactly how any of that stuff really happens. So I really just got to the point where it was like, I just, I just make things louder. So, if you aren't familiar with the whole process of recording, that's fine. I'm going to give you a very, very, very high level overview. Because the details aren't important, that's not really what this talk is about. So, you can see from this figure, which I stole from somewhere on the internet, because, you know, you do that. Let's just say we have microphones on a drum set. We have a DI box, which I won't even explain what that does. It just lets guitars get plugged into things, and then you have a microphone on a guitar amp, and you have a vocal mic. You plug all these things into a mixing console, then you run that out to a recorder of some type. Um, nowadays, it's a digital recorder because, you know, the future. Uh, an example might be, look at all the microphones on this drum kit. Yes, they do have a purpose. I just want to say that right up front. Do you need this many? Eh, you know. This you don't. This is just silly, but I thought it was funny <laughs> to put four microphones on an acoustic. This is actually from, a, like, at this studio. They were just doing mic tests to hear what different mics. So you see, hey, you have a microphone. You record it on a track. It's all <clears throat> very exciting. Um, or nowadays, you just take a microphone, you run it to a mic preamplifier, which just makes the microphone louder. Like I said, that's what I do. Then you run it through a compressor, which keeps things from getting too loud. Then you run it through an equalizer, which is kind of like your home stereo, except a lot more expensive. And then you run it into some sort of interface and record it on a computer. That's how recording works. Congratulations, you're all now recording engineers. Then the question is, okay, what's the point of this talk? Why am I giving this talk? It's not because I'm old and grumpy. I am old and grumpy, but that's an 
thinking out about this. Uh, and it's not that I'm old, therefore I'm wiser. And no, I don't believe that. I still listen to new music, surprisingly, except that Justin Bieber kid. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the reason for this talk is software is experiencing a lot of the same issues that recording did 20 years ago. It used to be that audio engineering was a very formalized uh, industry. It was a very formalized job. This, while a little staged, is actually a picture from Abbey Road Studios. The guys in the white coats are recording engineers. That is not a joke. No, they weren't all clustered around looking like they're not doing anything most of the time, but it, if you went to Abbey Road Studios, the audio engineer there, chances are they had an electrical engineering degree. Uh, they were going to be there an intern for either no money or little money, and they had a very technical job. Um, Abbey Road, EMI Studios is what it was originally called, they actually built their gear, except for maybe the recorder. They built their, the console, they built their preamplifiers, they built their compressors, they built equalizers. They didn't build microphones, but they would tell someone, can you modify or build a microphone that kind of does this? It was a very technical undertaking. So at Abbey Road, you wore a lab coat. You looked like a technician. This is a picture of, the guy on the right is Sir George Martin. That is the producer of the Beatles. Notice he's wearing a tie. That is not a stage photo. That is what he wore pretty much the entire time he worked for DECA and was a record producer. The guy in the front is, uh, his name's Norman Smith. He was the first engineer for the Beatles. Yes, that is what he wore to work. He didn't show up in t-shirts and jeans. He wore a tie. It was a very formalized thing. There were very formalized things you could do. There's stories you can actually get a book on the recording of the Beatles that is a 500 page book that gives you all this technical detail. Because what they did kind of changed the entire landscape of recording. And one of the things that changed was they, Jeff Emmerich, who was their engineer in, in their middle phase, he had to ask for permission. He had to literally write a letter to the management and ask for permission to put the microphone closer to the drums than what they were normally allowed to do. Yeah, that's, to us, that seems ridiculous. To them, it's like, well, no, we have found that this particular microphone, you need it to be exactly this far from the source. Okay, great. Computer engineering used to be the same way. These are guys uh, from HP who designed the first HP, it was like the P, it wasn't like a PDP, it was a P something series. One guy was responsible for memory, one guy was responsible for I.O., one guy was responsible for the actual processor, one guy was responsible for writing the entire programming language. You know, it was a very, very formalized thing, and I think that this ad, this IBM ad, kind of explains it all. It's like having 150 extra engineers, all using slide rules. <laughs> Can anyone in this room actually use a slide rule? Seriously? Anyone? That's what I thought. So, audio engineering used to be a very formalized degree. Computer engineering used to be a very formalized degree because the original computer engineers were hardware engineers. They weren't, I didn't go to iron, um, iron Yard for however long and now I'm a computer engineer. No, I went to school for four years. I learned about logic gates, how they're made, the silica and how transistors work and all this other stuff, yada, yada, blah, blah. So as things have progressed, audio has gone the same way. And I'm not going to stand up here and say it's better or worse. It just is. Just like I didn't go to school for audio and I didn't go to school for computer programming. I just had to pick it up along the way. Does that make me a better or worse audio engineer or programmer? Well, I think that's really more you look at the results than, you know, what I may have or may not have learned, right? Same thing for audio. There's a lot of people who can go to Guitar Center or whatever and get enough to make a record. 
Does that make them a bad engineer? Well, you have to look at the results. So there's a lot of things that apply. There's a lot of things that I experienced in the world of audio that actually do correlate to the world of computer programming. The first of which is technology and how technology has changed to the point that before, if you wanted to write a program, you had to make a pretty big investment. If you wanted to make a record, you had to make a pretty big investment. This is a Sony 48-track digital machine. This is, that's a SSL console. SSL is not secure socket layer, it's solid state logic. It's a British company. They became, in the 80s, they started making consoles that had computers in them. Oh, imagine that. That would allow you to use the computer to record the position of every button and knob on the console. So that way you could do a recall. So you would have this little, it, it looked like a bad Atari graphic that would show you kind of where, here's a circle, and here's a black line that shows you where the position of the knob should be. And here's a white line that shows you where it currently is. You turn the knob and you see the graphic change. It was like playing a, a bad game of Pong. But the idea was you could set the console up, all the buttons and switches the way it had worked before, and all of the faders, the little faders at the bottom. Um, originally, they didn't move. They used voltage control amplifiers to change the level, just like someone was standing there making it louder, making it softer, making it louder, making it softer. And later they put a little motor in there with this little thin wire that would actually physically move the fader. It's pretty neat if you see it the first time. It's like, ooh, a ghost. Uh, <clears throat> but here's the problem. That Sony 48-track digital machine was $250,000. You can go on eBay, by the way, right now and find them for like 1000 And it's using digital tape. So not only did you have to have a machine, you then had to buy tape. And tape was about 200 bucks a reel. Digital machines, I think you could record about 30 minutes a reel. I'd have to go back and look. That console and the outboard equipment, you're looking at about a million dollars. That, that's a pretty hefty combination. That doesn't even take into account where are you gonna put this stuff? And building studios is the most expensive type of construction you can do. Well, if you're curious, I'll explain it to you later, but the, the idea is you're not building it once, you're building it three times, effectively. So every wall you build, you wind up building three times. Well, how did things progress? Welcome to 1992. This is called the Alesis ADAT. This is an eight-track digital recorder that records on super VHS tapes, yes, VCR tapes. Um, this became the recording standard for several years. Why? This is an 8-track digital recorder that list price was under $4,000. You could sync, I believe it was up to 12 of these things together. So to have a 48-track digital recorder now only cost you $23,000, a little under $24,000. One-tenth the price of what you would have had to spend in 1991. One-tenth. I'm not going to get into the fact that they were incredibly unreliable and actually didn't sound that good, but you could sync this to anything. And my rental company wound up owning like 10 of them at one point. I used them on projects. I hated them. But the thing is, that changed the world. The other thing that changed the world, 1991, a company called Mackie Designs in Washington released this mixer. It's a 16 input mixer a lot of bells and whistles for under a thousand dollars you could actually add automation to that thing for like another 500 bucks I think you could actually automate the levels the faders didn't move but you could add fader level automation to this thing so for less than two thousand dollars you had a 16 input mixer that was automated I mean before you were gonna spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to get anywhere close to that. So this is the democratization of recording. In the early 90s, it completely changed. And wait, there's more. 
So it's kind of hard to see, but the thing at the bottom is an ADAT. The thing at the top is a Mackie mixer, it's just a different one. Every year, uh, every, actually twice a year, there's a conference of the a AES, which is the Audio Engineer Society. The AES is actually the formal part of this convention where they, like, you have a new digital recording technology, well, you would have someone from your company present a white paper. Just like if you went to Oopsla or something like that, where it's like, I've created this language called Scala, and I want to introduce it to you. It's, it's a very formal gathering of geeks, and these people are geeks. Um, not all people in recording are as interesting as me. Um, well, the other part of it is a gear show. So it's all the manufacturers who are like, look at our new shiny, shiny. This was actually called Shit on a Stick. This was a piece of art created by a guy named Fletcher who had a company called Mercenary Audio in Boston. Mercenary was known for selling vintage equipment before it was really kind of cool. And they were real purist audio snobs. I mean, which is fine, you know, it takes all kinds. So at the AES show, they had this at their booth. Elisis, the manufacturer of the recorder, got really pissed off and went to the AES and said, you know, he can't do that. He's not supposed to do that. So the AES went to him and said, you got to take it down. And, he, and he, he relented and took it down. But the funny thing is Greg Mackey, the guy that designed the mixer, saw it before he took it down and looked at it and went, bet it still works. <laughs> so but Greg Mackey is this like ex-Boeing hippie engineer. He did this funny. But you can see there was a little bit of pushback. Well, one more piece of audio technology. This is a New England digital synclavier. This is a sampler. This little get up could record to disk. It could do samples. A lot of people use these. Frank Zappa used it. A lot of um, score writers, a lot of composers for film and everything would use these things. Now the problem is that setup was over $100,000. And it didn't even have that many tracks, and it didn't let you sample all that much. So $100,000 in 1984, well, the 1970s, the Techniques released the SP-1200, a direct drive um, record player. But the real benefit and the real, the real change in urban music I mean, I'm talking everything from hip hop to rap to, I mean, it's, it really kind of affected everything, including rock and a bunch of other styles, was this thing. This is called the Akai MPC, which stands for MIDI Production Center, MPC 60. That's a sampler too. That is what launched people like Dr. Dre and all these other producers who would use samples taken from vinyl sample them into this 12-bit sampler that had a maximum of 13 seconds of record time, you would play the gray pads on the left. You would play it like, like you were tapping on you know, a drum machine, because that's kind of what it is. But it had a sequencer in it. It had individual outs, so you could run your kick drum to one track and all this other stuff. And it could also sync to a tape machine. The price of this thing was, I believe, about $2,000. So we went from $100,000 to two grand. People could put enough money together to get one of these. And if you had a set of headphones and you probably could get a used SP-1200, you're now a producer. You can now sit in your bedroom and make songs using samples of stuff you've heard. And you could go get an ADAT. Well, a few years later you can get an ADAT. Sync it to this, record your vocals, congratulations. You, you are now a producer producing records. So we went from recording studios being this incredibly massive capital investment to being something you could do in your bedroom. So now you're sitting there going, great, but what does this have to do with me? First, it's a very rude question, and you shouldn't ask it like that. <laughs> Second, computers are facing something very similar. The browser, JavaScript, HTML5, 
I'm going to pick a lot of JavaScript on this in this talk, mainly because it's easier to get images that have to do with JavaScript than it is for like Android and other stuff. Um, and this is not saying things are bad. This is saying this is how things are. What is the most used programming language in the world? JavaScript. Why? You can run it in your browser. Where do you get a browser? Wherever you get a computer. So now everyone can be a programmer. No longer is it the realm of the guys with the ties and the suits using timeshare on a PDP 11. No, it's everybody. Everyone can write code. It's the same thing I dealt with when everyone who could scrap together a few thousand dollars was now an audio engineer and a record producer. And again, don't think that I'm harping on this. It's just technology. It's the way it works. It's a great time to be in audio. Why? Because you have access to things that before you couldn't even dream of. It's a great time to be in programming. Why? Because that's all it takes, man. If you have an idea and you have the drive, you can write it. And you can deploy it in a way that you couldn't imagine a few years ago. If you want people to use your app, you can put a, build a website that's powered by your app. And what is it going to cost you? Very little. I mean, you can go to AWS. You can go to, I mean, if you have an iPhone, you can create apps that way too. So Android, iPhone, same thing. If you have a laptop, and you, if you have a Mac, and you want to write iPhone apps, guess what? You download an app that doesn't cost you anything, and you start writing. If for some reason you want to do Android, you can do that too. Like, I kid, I kid. I kid because I love. Uh, but again, what does Android Studio cost? Nothing. Yeah. And a Windows machine is less expensive. You can run it on a Mac, whatever. So the barrier to entry has been all but eliminated. It's gone. If you have the will to do it, you can do it. Are you going to be great at it? Well, that's a different question altogether. So let's, with this amount of setup, sorry, it takes a minute, but let's actually get into some of the things I, I think are correlated. First of all, fundamentals matter. You know, the rest of this talk is going to be the most obvious talk you've ever heard. But it's only going to be obvious after I say it. And then you'll be like, well, yeah, it's kind of obvious. I'm a big believer that obvious isn't obvious until it's obvious. So fundamentals matter. In the world of audio, this is kind of the fundamental if you're doing music. Hey, look, sheet music. If you understand that, you're pretty well along your way. And I have taught a lot of people who wanted to be recording engineers and deal with music that couldn't read. I'm not talking about here, play this. I'm talking about, do you have any idea what that black dot and line is? Do you understand what anything on this page represents? This is the lingua franca, although that technically means the French language, of music. You don't understand this, you're not getting very far. Nowadays, if you can't look at source code and at least start to build an idea of what it says, yeah, you're not getting very far. It really doesn't matter what language you're, you're using. If you can't look at any programming language and at least start to understand the ideas the syntax is trying to get across to you, that's kind of a problem. So in the world of audio, there, there are a few things that I would consider to be fairly fundamental. Pitch, time, and tempo. On time and in tune. Wow, what a great concept. You'd be amazed. If you're doing music, the basics of song structure. You know what a verse is? You know what a chorus is? Do you know where they usually come? Do you know what an intro is? Do you know what the bridge is? 
When I say B section, you have any idea what I'm talking about? You know what a vamp is? Do you know what tw the structure of, the tw of a 12 bar blues song is? Not really that hard, but if you don't know that, you can't figure out the problem. Just like in software, basic syntax, pretty much from any language. If it's a C type language, you understand basic C type syntax, you've got a lot of languages covered. Boolean logic and or. Pretty simple concept, but if you can't get that one down, sequential logic. And this is why it seems like a lot of musicians sort of go into programming because there is very sequential logic to it. This part comes first, then this part, then this part, then we repeat, then this part, then we use the second ending, then this part, then this part, then we hit the coda, which means we're going over here, which is a go it's the musical go-to. And then you're going to do this, then you're going to do this, then the song is end, then you stand up and bow, and people clap. All right, that's generally how it works. You have to follow some type of sequential logic when you're programming. This will happen, then this will happen, then this will happen, and then the program will crash. Abstraction. If you can't think of things in, like, sheet music is very abstract because the notes represent notes. Okay, but what instrument? Well, you have to think about that. How what's going to sound like? What do I want it to sound like? Abstraction in programming, you know what it is, hopefully. Looping. Do this over and over and over. Assignment, this equals this. E algebraic assignment. I mean, simple algebraic. X plus Y equals something. Well, you're going to replace an X and Y. Ta-da, magic. Oh, and basic electronics, because that always matters. So these are the fundamentals. If you don't get this down, you got a problem. So if I'm in a session and someone tells me, get me in at the end of four on the bridge, if I don't know what they're saying, I'm, one, I'm going to look like an idiot. Two, I'm going to do the wrong thing, which is saying, get me in. I'm making a lot of assumptions. If it's 4-4, four, four, get me in on the second eighth note of beat four before the section I call the bridge, which is usually after the second chorus. Take it from the turn around through the van. Turn around is a section that usually ends either usually a bridge or solo or, and then the vamp, which is just, you're gonna play until we get sick of you. You can hear the ghost strokes. So if a drummer tells me this, ghost strokes are just the little taps they make on the snare drum between the backbeat. So if they're not hearing that little definition, then I have to take an action, which is usually tell them to shut up. Can you make it sound more purple? I, I, okay, actually, I don't know what that means. <laughs> but I have heard this. <laughs> Usually you just act like you're twisting a knob and go, huh? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> but the question is, well, how do you get there? Same way you get to Carnegie Hall. Practice. All right, Rems, thank you. I'll be here all week. <laughs> that is, how do you get the fundamentals down? You do it over and over and over and over and over and over and over. So I'm, I'm a big learner on how people learn. I, I, I love learning about how to improve things, how to get points across. I came across a um, comment about this study where a college pottery teacher decided to run an experiment. So he split the, the class in half. One half of the class, he said, I'm just going to grade you on weight. Not if you're fat, but how much product you produce. All semester long, just make something and make something and make something and make something. By the end, the more things you have made, the better your grade will be. The other part, he said, I'm going to grade you on one piece that you produce. You have all semester to work on this one piece. That one piece will represent your final grade. Now, at the end of the semester, who produced better pottery? Was it the people that suffered all semester long to produce one thing? Or was it the people that did it over and over? You, I can, you know where I'm going with this. They did it over and over 
and over and over. And by the end of the semester, they were producing better works than the people that were going to be graded on just one thing. I had all semester long to produce one thing. Why? Because they did it, and they did it over, and they did it over, and they did it over. Some people call it practice. Some people, in the musicians call it woodshedding. It's like going behind the woodshed and working, you know, practicing. As a drummer, no one wants to hear you practice no matter how good you are, so there you go. It doesn't matter how bad a guitarist is, someone will listen. I've never understood this. <laughs> Second thing I learned is you can't polish a turd. Oh, I mean, you can if you freeze it first. <clears throat> but the point of this is that in audio, if your song sucks, there's not a damn thing I can do about it. There is not a magic microphone, a particular piece of gear, or a studio I can go to that's going to make that song not suck. And what we do, if it's a bad idea, if the idea for your app sucks or your client app sucks or whatever, I'm sorry. It doesn't matter how many lines of code you put into it. It doesn't matter what framework you're using. It doesn't matter. It sucks. And it's, it's a hard thing to accept sometimes is I am rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. You know, I can drop this turd in liquid nitrogen and polish it up to a shine, but it's still a turd. <laughs> so, has anyone ever thought that was a good idea? Or that? So, if someone comes to you with this idea, run. Well, hopefully they'll come to you. You'll know about it before sales will because they'll be like, I love it. <laughs> so the, the idea being these are bad ideas I'm sorry these are bad ideas pictures look great that is a wonderful image of a bad idea so we have another saying it's the ear not the gear basic idea is this is a cassette four track. It actually uses cassettes. Does anyone remember what those are? Remember the old guy sitting, the old cassette? Okay, anyway, records four tracks on a cassette, which at the time, big deal, awesome, cheap. That is an SM57 microphone. That is more or less most engineers' desert island microphone. Because not only can you record with it, you can use it as a hammer. <laughs> And it will probably sound better afterwards. <laughs> that is a $100 microphone. That's about as cheap as a microphone as you can get. Made in America. And the Tascam, I mean, you could get a, nowadays you can get a digital four track recorder for like $100. Seriously, it's crazy. But if, it's, if the song sounds good on that using that microphone, it's a good song. That means now you can actually add polish to it and it's going to get better. If it sounds like crap on this, we can go back to the $250,000 Sony and the $100,000, I mean, the million dollar SSL, and congratulations, it still sucks. So when we see pictures like this, no, he does, he's not compensating for something. He's actually one of the biggest mixers uh, in the world. But if you have all that stuff, it doesn't make a difference. I mean, it's, it's nice. Like that's a, this is actually in the studio of the Performing Arts Center. This was the outboard rack. You know, you see a lot of knobs and everything else. It's all gear I chose because I liked it. I used it. Sounds good. But if you don't know what this stuff does, it doesn't matter. Look, think about it. When you were a kid, you may have got the 8-pack. I never got the 96-pack. I miss you, 96. But if you give someone who doesn't know how to draw these crayons, guess what you get? It's my garden! You know, congratulations. Okay, maybe this was like a three-year-old, I'm just being a dick, but. <laughs> but if, if you give someone all the, this huge palette, this entire range of options, and that's the best they can do, well, good luck for trying. 
But someone who knows what they're doing, you give them a pencil. That's a pencil drawing. That is not a photograph. That is a pencil drawing done by a human. So if you give someone who knows what they're doing the right tool or a tool, you get something great. Why? Because it's not the gear. It's you. You determine the quality. That's the whole idea of it's not, it, it, it's the ear, not the gear. It's how the engineer hears and how they apply what they're hearing, not the tools. I mean, you can have all the tools in the world. It's not going to make a difference. It's you. You have to have the skills to do it. So picking on JavaScript, because I can, I mean, you, you see people who are always talking about, oh, well, this is... This is going to solve my problem. This I'll use this framework. I'll use Node, and I will. It will run great and never crash. And then I'll use React because React is functional and other things that I don't understand. But it's supposed to be great because I read a blog post, and I'm going to use that. Well, great, but if you had a pencil and you knew what you were doing, you wouldn't need all the crayons to draw a smiley face. You know. It's not this stuff. Stop looking to this stuff to solve your problems, because it's not. If you don't know what you're doing, nothing's going to help. Another thing, listeners don't care about your religious debate, and I'm not talking about the good book type. I'm talking about in the early 80s, well, late 80s, early 90s, you probably think that, oh, well, this is a recorder, because you've seen, like, you know, we have the suspect in sight. Go ahead and start the recording. Like from a movie or something? Yeah, that's just a two-track recorder. That's not going to do you a whole lot of good. This is a 24-track recorder. It uses two-inch tapes. You the red spools, that black stuff, that's tape. Tape, by the way, for those of you technically minded, is effectively rust glued to plastic. Look it up. This is a 24-track recorder made by a Swiss company called Studer sort of the Rolls-Royce of audio. I mean, it's like a, that's the gold edition, which I think it is. That's about a $75,000 analog recorder. All it does is record and play back. That's it. You can't, you like, edit and all this stuff. Sound fantastic. I love these machines. These machines are workhorses. They sound fantastic. They work great. Lovely, lovely device. But early 90s, Pro Tools came along. You probably, who in here has actually heard of Pro Tools? Yeah, exactly. How many of you have ever stepped in a recording studio? Yeah, exactly. So what I'm saying is most people here know what Pro Tools is who've never been in a recording studio. Why? Because this is how you make records. That is how you record now. Some people who have the money, who want the nostalgia, will whip out the two-inch machine and record. The only problem is, that reel of two inch tape running at 30 inches a second, which is the, usually you want to run, I'm not going to get into that, anyway. At 30 inches a second, that 2,500 foot spool will give you 15 minutes of recording and cost you $250. If I were going to buy a hard drive, what could I get for 250 bucks? Two, four terabytes. Um, I could probably, I mean, I could get SSD, which is going to be incredibly fast and do pretty well. And that 250 gigabytes will record months of multi-track audio. So tell me, if I was going to make a record, do I want to spend 250 bucks per 15 minutes and I might not even use what I recorded? Or am I going to be like, oh, I'll just record whatever and then I'll put it on a thumb drive and off you go. But the religious debate was, oh, analog is better. Oh, no, digital makes life, blah, blah, blah. It became a religious debate. It's like tabs and spaces. And the correct answer for that is shut up. No one cares. Why? The person listening to the record isn't going to be like, eh, it would have been a better song if they recorded it on analog. No, they don't know or care. No one cares. 
you know, if you want to if you want to do a native app, you want to use Java on Android and you want to use Swift or Objective-C on Xcode or whatever, everyone's like, oh, well, you know, it'd be so much better if you use Xamarin and compile once, crash everywhere. <laughs> because, you know what? If you made a good app, your user doesn't care. Man, this would have been a better app if they used Xamarin. I'm telling you what, that's C-sharp language. Woo! No, never heard it. And I, I would love for someone to write an algorithm to go through and scrape all the reviews in the Xcode, I mean, I'm sorry, in the, the App Store or Google Play and be like, well, if they'd only used Java 7 or, you know, I could obviously tell they weren't using the Lambda expressions in, in Java 8 for this. You know, who cares? No one cares. No one buys a record because you recorded it on Pro Tools or didn't. No one buys an app because you did it in Java or Xamarin. They buy it because they need something done. Not because, oh, I love Java. Said no one ever. <laughs> More to that point, no one buys the record because of the microphone the singer used. This is a Neumann U87. This is a mic that was built in the 50s using a tube, a vacuum tube, that was originally designed for radios. It is one of the things that gave this mic its signature. It has a very distinctive sound. This is a fantastic sounding microphone built in the 50s. They are still used today. And there are companies, probably at least 10 companies, that make a modern version of this. Oh, look, it's the Beatles using a, a U47. Well, if I use that microphone, or that's a great song because of a U47. Oh, look, it's old Blue Eyes singing, and there's a lot of pictures with him with U47s. Great, wonderful, not going to make a difference. This is an Ella M251. This is a modern reissue. The originals will cost you anywhere from ten to fifteen thousand dollars. A new one will cost you anywhere from five to eight thousand dollars. Hey, look, it's Bruce Springsteen singing to an LM251. Fantastic sounding mic. I mean, I, I once commented it sounds like God's breath. It's it's a it's a ridiculously good sounding mic. But no one cares. This, on the left, is a Shure SM7B. It's mainly used for broadcast. On the right is a Shure SM58, the brother, sister, don't really know, of the SM57. This would be the vocal Desert Island microphone, because you could kill something with it, eat it, and then still use the microphone. The one on the left, has probably been used for more vocals than just about anything. That's a $350 microphone. There are plenty of images of like Steven Tyler from, um, great, yeah, them, um, singing with this mic. I mean, you, you can find a lot of videos of people in the studio singing into one of these. Why? Because it sounds great, it works. It provides a certain thing. The SM58, I think, is like a $105 microphone. And Bono from YouTube, that, that's what he uses. That's it. He doesn't use a $15,000 microphone. He uses a $100 microphone. Granted, sometimes it sounds like it. But are you going to say, well, the streets have no name, would have been so much better if you used a U47? No. Who cares? Your user doesn't care. So like all this, that's all good and fine, but again, no one's gonna buy the record because the singer used a 58. No one cares. Another one, nothing is sacred. What do I mean by that? Don't touch it. I spent forever miking that guitar. Don't touch it, it's the perfect sound. You know what? Whenever I saw an intern or assistant spending forever miking something, I would walk over and just kick the mic over. Be like, stop worrying about it, man. 
Stick your head down there. Where does it sound good? Put the microphone. Let's go. We got things to do. We are not, this is not the audio equivalent of the Mona Lisa. We are trying to record something so that then we can move on. People treat their code like that. No, don't touch it. That's the most perfect expression of that algorithm ever. No, probably not. You know, you wrote it, do it again. And when you do it again, you'll probably do it faster and better. Because all of that, it's the process. Stop worrying so much about it. If you have the fundamentals down, these sort of things go very quickly. I'm not going to worry too much about, is the mic a little here, is the mic a little there? Most of the time, you can't, you can't tell the difference. You're going to start worrying about things that just don't matter. I mean, yes, I have spent days going between different drums. Oh, when he's this snare, this symbol, where do we need to put it in the room? Yes. Why? Because we could. It was fun to experiment. But ultimately, it didn't make a difference on the record sales. Some shiny things are just shiny. They're not better. You know, it, it's, it, it's this thought that because it's new, it must be better. It's not really the case, and especially in the world of audio. That is a console that was built in 1974, thereabouts. I love that console. I want to hug that console. I want that console to come home with me and read me the phone book. I don't care. It's a Neve console made by a British company. Dear computer, all right. Um, that console will probably sell for at least what the person paid for it originally or more. Why? Because, well, audio kind of reached its peak in the 70s. And these are amazing designs that sound great. Here's the modern version. Now, you're looking at $40,000 worth of mic preamplifiers and EQs. That's only eight channels. This is brand new. It's built, it's made by, I won't say the same company because that company changed hands several, several times. But these are brand new, built the same way. Oh, and look, here's the software version. Why? Because these things work, and they work really well, and they sound really good. So why reinvent the wheel? Here's one more for our world. This is an RMX 16. This is a digital reverb processor that was built in the late 70s. Uh, it's a 12-bit computer. And because it is computer, it was not actually allowed to be imported to some countries because they're like, well, this is a computer. You know what you could do with a computer? I hear you could launch missiles with a computer. It's like, well, no, this is, this is a reverb. It makes things go That's the inside. I used to own one of these things. And it is a heavy, clunky, huge fan. That's it. I mean, that, you can see, oh, look, there are all the ICs and all the memory chips. It's old. But it sounds, oh, it had nine programs on it. You had nine presets. One, two, three, four, six, seven, nine. Nine. That's it. But each one, you're like, oh, that sounds good. Here's the software version. No, nope. that's the hardware version. No, nope, not right. Okay. Look, it's the software version. Why? Because it works. Last one. This is a Fairchild 670. This is a tube compressor. It was originally designed to be put in front of um, acetate lathe for cutting records. You can actually see it's it's labeled as. Latitude and what's the other one? Yeah, uh, vertical. So, basic idea is it was meant to keep things from going too far left and right and too far up and down. It has to do with the way records work. Too far left and right controls frequency and your stereo image. Up and down is volume. You don't want the needle popping out. All right, well, this cantankerous compressor, people used to throw them away. It has 20 tubes in it. It has like 20 transformers. You really don't want to drop this thing on your toe, man. Bad idea. A vintage one, right now, will cost you somewhere between forty and $60,000. This is a modern version of it. There's a few companies that make modern version of it. None of them sell for less than $10,000. Here's the software version of it. Why? Because it's that good. This is actually, if you look in the upper right, uh, left-hand corner, Jack Joseph Puig, 
collection. Yeah, Jack Joseph was the guy sitting in the middle of all those pieces of gear. And I said, was that compensating? Yeah, this is an emulation of one of his pieces of gear. So the idea that the newest, latest, greatest is always better isn't true. Sure, do, better things do come along. So please don't think that I'm like, oh, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. No. But there are some ideas that are pretty damn solid. You know, if we looked at, has anyone ever seen the picture? I wish I had it. Uh, John McCarthy, the guy that created Lisp, the little meme that says you're doing it wrong. That's, there's a lot of truth to that. Just because it's new, shiny, shiny, doesn't mean it's a better way to do it. Doesn't mean it's, it can often be, here's another layer you've got to deal with. Here's more crap you have to learn that's distracting you from the fact you don't understand the underlying problem. Another one, you can't fix it in the mix. It's a phrase that means that you have recorded crap, now we gotta mix it and we'll figure it out then. This is the, you've been building a piece of software that's a piece of crap because you didn't stop to actually think about what you were doing to begin with. That's what this is and here's, this is a, famous in the audio world. Ringman's last day is the band's sound engineer. Why? Right there. It's the suck now. Um, on those SSL consoles, the big consoles, there's places for uh, relay contacts that have button caps and you can order custom button caps. can't tell you how many times I've got, walked into a studio and there's like a suck button. So, if you're building a turd, if you're recording something, this is the control room of the facility that I designed and built, this isn't going to help you. There are literally thousands of knobs and switches on this console. I actually calculated it one time because I'm that kind of person. Um, there's not a single one on there that's like rock. There's not an unsuck button. If you recorded crap, I can turn all of those up and it's not going to make a difference. I can run through every piece of gear there, it's not going to help. If you have decided on an architecture that really doesn't solve your problems, if you're using a language that is working against you, you are using design patterns that are screwing you over, or you dealing with requirements that are just going the opposite direction, you can't fix that. You can add, you can double the lines of code. It's not going to help. The last one, architecture matters. This is in the real estate sense of the word. Where is this? Abbey Road. Abbey Road Studios, originally called EMI Studios. EMI is Electric Music Industries. So the <clears throat> this is the cover of the album Abbey Road. Abbey Road is the name of the studio they recorded this in. This is actually right outside the studio, which is, this is the front entrance of the studio, Abbey Road. You can't really see it that well, but this is a plaque, that's not what I wanted. This is a plaque that says Sir Edward Elgar. This studio was originally built in 1931 for Sir Edward Elgar and St. Martin in the Field. So he was a conductor, St. Martin in the Field was the orchestra. They built the studio so they could start doing recordings. This is the famous Studio 2. This is where the Beatles did a majority of their work. That's a recent picture. Doesn't look like they changed a whole lot in that room, does it? Why? Because it sounds amazing. There's no reason to try to improve something that works incredibly well already. This is at Sony Pictures. I've actually been in this room. Uh, this is Sony Pictures. This is the Streisand scoring stage. This was originally built, and the first, they, okay, this was originally built in 1939. They had to stop construction so they could do the soundtrack for The Wizard of Oz. After they were done, they decided not to finish it. Look at all that brown. That's brown press board. By press board, I mean think of it's kind of like slightly denser cord board, like slightly denser cord board, but if it gets wet, it swells up. 
It wears out really easily and it's cheap. This is all the sub flooring and the sub walls, not the sub, but they're the backing. They never replaced it. They never finished it. If a piece of wood needs to be replaced, they put down the exact same thing. Why? This room sounds amazing for orchestras and they have not changed it since 1930. You walk into it, you're like, oh yeah, they haven't walk into it, you're like, oh yeah, they haven't changed this since 1939. It looks like crap. This is actually a really good picture. It is a crappy looking room. But you walk in there and just clap your hands. You know, the normal audio geek thing, you want to hear Weaver tale, how the frequency response is over time and all that stuff. You go, oh, okay, that makes sense. Because here's the idea. The violin is a wretched, wretched instrument. <laughs> instrument. There's a reason that you have a hundred of them playing at one time. Because one is completely unbearable. Two makes it a little easier. But if you add a whole bunch and it becomes a wash, it's a lot easier to listen to. Same goes for most string instruments. Well, the problem is that with a violin, unless you have someone who's really, really, really good, they are just a good, they are just a screechy, disgusting mess. This room has a way of sort of absorbing all that high end and making anything that's really bright sound very full and natural and wonderful. It's a fantastic sounding room for orchestra. But it looks like crap. Why didn't they change anything? How are we going to improve this? This is exactly what we wanted. So we stopped. So we stopped. Last example. This is a place called East West Recording uh, in LA. It's actually changed hands several times, but it's now owned by a company called East West that does samples. They originally did sample libraries. They do more than that, but they're huge in sample libraries. So like, if you were scoring film, you would probably use their sample library for strings, for temps, and then you use them up underneath when you actually record the real orchestra make underneath when you actually record the real orchestra make sound even bigger. So anyway, this studio uh, used to be called Ocean Way, and it's originally, as a studio, it was called Western Recorders. It was built in the late 50s. It actually used to be a grocery store. But then they came in, made some adjustments. Um, is this the room? I have been in this room too. Yeah, um, and it, it again is like, well, yeah, I can definitely feel the fifties here, but it sounds fantastic. It sounds big. It sounds fantastic. It sounds big and controlled. It's wonderful. Why, they they did the basics. That's really what it comes down to. They did the basics right. They understood the basics of acoustics and the basics of recording. So when they built these things. They built them in a way that didn't try to rewrite or break any of the laws of physics. You know, it doesn't matter what you do, there's certain laws of physics you can't change. They realized we're going to keep this very simple. Notice that all the rooms I showed you were just really, really big boxes. Small boxes don't work. Big boxes work big for recording. So if you, so if you play with the laws and you adhere to them, they will work for you. So in the world of programming, none of these rooms are clever. They aren't. They're basic. They're simple. But they adhere to well-known laws. In programming, so often, we try to be clever. We try to do something that is a little different for no apparent reason, and we ignore those fundamental laws. Simplicity is kind of laws. Simplicity is kind of important. Simplicity, one of those things you really can't get away from. The other point I want to mention is that all of the studios that I showed you have modern recording equipment. They have a, a lot of the latest grace gear. They have the Pro Tools systems. They have all the nice mics. They also have vintage stuff, yes. But just because the room may look old, it doesn't mean that they abandon technology completely. No. Our acoustics work. Our acoustics work. The physical plant, we don't need to change. Any speaker I put in there is going to work because the room itself works. 
So in, when we deal with software, if you don't have that fundamental foundation of your app, or even the fundamental foundation of how you approach programming down, changing the language, changing the framework, changing any of these things doesn't make a difference, and it's not going to help. Why? Because you don't have the acoustics right. You didn't build this thing properly. So if you're doing a web app and you're doing it in JavaScript, if you're doing it in JavaScript, maybe a bad example, and you're trying to follow good practices and everything, well then swapping out frameworks could help you because your foundation is solid. If it's not solid and you're like, well, I want to use this one, well, maybe this will work, well, maybe this will work. You're not even like slapping paint on there. You're just throwing junk in, trying to fix a problem that you need to step back and look at the problem and say, maybe my back and look at the problem and say, maybe my foundation isn't solid. So there are a lot of parallels, and you can go to any industry and probably find similar parallels. Mine just happened to be what I did for a living. So really a lot of this comes down to, if you understand the fundamentals, don't get caught up in all the shiny, shiny, and really know that if you're building a solid foundation, you're going to be a lot more successful. And you can apply that pretty much to anything. So, I hope it wasn't too confusing. Again, I don't really know how to finish this particular talk. But are there, first, thanks for coming. First, thanks for coming. And second, any questions? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Generally, they don't care because they are more concerned with how am I going to get you something to listen to. I mean, there's a whole other angle of this that we could have talked about how iTunes changed and all that stuff, and that's sort of not, it, it's sort of tangential. It, it's, it's important, yes, but it's not really part of the, I, like how consumers buy apps doesn't generally change how you're going to write an app. And just how people consume music doesn't really change how I'm going to record it. I mean, I know that there's, there's a difference in the end product and there's a whole thing about compression and loudness wars and how iTunes and MP3s have changed everything. But if you write a solid song and you record it well, it really doesn't matter if the person's going to listen to it on a 180 gram vinyl on some hi-fi system, or if they're going to throw in their earbuds and listen to a crappy MP3 of it. It's still going to be a good song. And just like if you write a good app that's useful, it doesn't really matter if they're going to use an iPhone or an iPad or if there's a desktop version of it or a web version. You know, a good app is a good app. How it is consumed almost becomes superfluous. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm wondering about what you think about the, the value going forward of a computer, computer science degree. And here's where I come from that. So, like, you know, my talk is about teaching kids to program and things like that. And so, a, a lot of people in education don't, to them, programming equals computer science. Right. In, in my mind, programming is a tool that is used not only in computer science but in other disciplines as well, but there's computer science is so much more than just programming. So, and, and then I think, so my, so my question, not only from that level in terms of what's the, how do we convince that the, the, there is a benefit to computer science, or is there a benefit to a computer science degree going forward? I sort of view the computer science as really more the electrical engineering of Recording. Um, I do know electrical engineers who are very good recording engineers. Are they good recording engineers because they're electrical engineers? I don't, I don't want to confuse correlation and causation. 
Um, I know computer programmers who got degrees in computer science, and they're very good. And I know I can list off several people that I work with, and, and even myself, that have no formal degree. If you are looking to get into programming, I want to write apps. I'm not entirely convinced that computer science is necessary or even beneficial because computer science, I mean, pure computer science, how did I hear this explained? Computer science, like programming is to computer science what a ruler is to geometry. Yes, you will use programming in computer science, just like you will use a ruler in geometry, but they're not the same thing. You know, you can do geometry without ever touching a ruler, without ever touching a ruler. You can do computer science without ever really writing code, because there's so much more to it. It's such a broad field, and programming is such a narrow field. To that point, one thing I used to tell my students when I was teaching was, all right, if this is the environment that you learn best in, then great. If you are more of a person who can watch a video and then grab a microphone and plug it into their computer and start recording, you're in the wrong place. The benefit of being here is not so much what you learn, but the connections that you make and being around people of a like mind. So sometimes education is really all about that. It's about being with people who are trying to learn the same thing, making those connections, having people to bounce ideas off of versus I want to learn how to build a computer from Gates. Um, it's one of those questions that it's almost, the, it depends on the person, depends on the situation. Well, like I would always, again, tell my students, it depends. So, again, sort of simplify, my view is if you want to be a programmer, computer science may not be the way to, to get there, especially if you want to get there fast. If you want to use programming as a tool in computer science, then you're going to need to get a degree in computer science, because that's really what you're that make any sense at all? Are you nodding just to be nice? <laughs> Are we married? <laughs> I, think, I mean, I think that uh, they're, 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 I think of it in terms of black boxes. Mm -hmm. you, you can be a user of a black box. We're all users of black box mm -hmm. at some level. But specifically in this, I mean, if you want to be a user of a black box, you, you can go out and Learn, learn the basics and, and start using them. Mm -hmm. If you want to build the black box that other people can use, then, then you need to have a you need to have a well grounded uh, yeah, I, I, like, and, and just from here the fundamentals I think matter. How you come across those fundamentals is a little less important, but the fundamentals are are what it's all about. Once you have that down, it just comes down to getting experience. Now if you really want to learn, get the fundamentals down, then once you have that just go get the experience, and that's you do the same thing over and over. You build on those fundamentals. So it's it's a very broad question. Having been a teacher and a terrible student, the way a lot of things are taught is a problem. Uh, the view that you have to have a degree in something, a degree equals knowledge, is a problem. Um, so my personal view is I, degrees don't excite me. Um, but for some people, it is very beneficial. But that's my way of getting out of answering that question. <laughs> Have a nice day. <laughs>